Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Josh and Jason Muddy Christian and Conspiracy Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Muddy. If you don't know me, I'm a Christian rapper, devoted husband, father, and Army veteran. And I'd like to introduce you to my co-host. He's a Christian, devoted husband, father, and my brother. What's up, Jason? How's it going, bro? Pretty good. And welcome back, all of you guys. Uh, thanks for coming back, everybody. I, I enjoy all of you guys. You're awesome. And uh, yeah, let's let's kick it off with this, this prophecies of, of Daniel and... Uh, and I think yeah, it's gonna be this, it's gonna be awesome. So, guys, we have a book of Daniel roundtable, and for me, this is like the WrestleMania Bible studies. Uh, we have some amazing <laughs> guests that. for you guys. <laughs> we were just talking about that. Just oh, really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wasn't even on for that. So yeah, you guys yeah, see. Yeah. So, all right, guys. So first off, we have uh, uh, Mount Crushmore, uh, Genesis Six conspiracy author Gary Wayne. How you doing, Gary? Doing very well, and uh, thank you for inviting me to the show with such a awesome panel and awesome hosts. I think I might have to be more quiet than anything and just take notes tonight, but so happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And also, we have the author of The Second Coming of Saturn, uh, Derek Gilbert, and he has a whole list of other books uh, that you guys can look into. How's it going, Derek? Doing fine. Greetings from the Ozarks. <laughs> Thank you. And then uh, next up, we have uh, the author of the Omega Dynamics, uh, Jamie Walden. How's it going, Jamie? Yeah, thanks for having me on, bro. I appreciate it. All right. And then uh, next up, we have the host of Bible Mysteries. How's it going, Scott? Doing great. Good to see you guys again. What up, Scott? And then uh, next up, uh, Think Again Productions. Uh, we have Ali Sayadatan. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Thank you for having me, Josh. Good to be here, Jason. Good to see you guys. Good to see you too, buddy. All right, so you look a little tired there. You see your eyes are a little low. <laughs> it's, well, we're gonna for Ali. We're gonna start at eight o'clock next time. You know, I, I apologize, Ali. I just had everybody on board for nine, and and I, I no worries, I, no worries. I, I really want to do that to next go. time. So, all right, perfect. All right, so guys, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start out in uh, Daniel chapter two. Uh, what I'll do real quick is just tell you guys. Uh, Chapter one, man, I just I just want to tell you guys a lot of the book of Daniel for me is amazing. You know, um, him and his three companions, it's like a perfect example of how to like a true believer should navigate in a pagan society. You know, I think chapter one is like that. Uh, we're going to jump now to chapter two so that uh, these gentlemen could uh, could just, you know, take it down and 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 um, kind of give us give us their input and and their amazing knowledge that they've studied throughout the years. So um Starting out in Daniel chapter two, um, we could start with Ali. We could start with you, if if you'd like to uh, kind of start out, and then we'll just go. Um, okay, um, okay. So I'll just kind of lay the groundwork um, in the Hebrew canon um, of the Old Testament. I found it interesting that the book of Daniel is not classified among the prophets. So the Hebrew canon has three sections: you know, the Law, the Torah, the instructions, then the Nevaim which has the historical and prophetic books, like God speaks and God does. That's why the historical and prophetic books are together, because the history testifies to the unfolding of the word of God concerning Israel. And then you have the wisdom writings, the Ketuvim. And the book of Daniel, the scroll of Daniel, is among them instead of being in the prophetic books. And I thought, why is that? And there's one distinction that I see um, all the other prophetic books that talk about the Messiah and the establishing of the kingdom of God talk about it from the point of view of the history and the story of Israel. Um, even Zechariah chapter 14, which kind of gives us the window into the final moments of history, uh, the nations gather against Jerusalem and the Messiah comes on Mount of Olives, fights the enemies of God and establishes the kingdom on the earth. Um, it's all from the point of view of the centrality of Jerusalem and the story of Israel. But the book of Daniel tells the same story uh, of history leading eventually to the kingdom, but tells it from the point of view of the Gentile empires. Um, eventually, we would call them the beast empires because they have these spiritual forces behind them. Um, I think that's why, starting in chapter 2, the book really switches from Hebrew to Aramaic which was the lingua franca, the international language of politics at the time of Daniel. Uh, you know, if, if different kingdoms wanted to write to each other, it would be done in Aramaic, because it's telling us that here God is going to open a window 
into um, these Gentile um, powers and show us the sequence of imperial force. It's like we're looking at the story, not from the point of view of Israel, but from the point of view uh, of the empires. And um, there's a very important uh, revelation in Daniel chapter 2, where Daniel receives the re response to what this dream means. And right there, he says, he proclaims, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and installs kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells in him. So this, this insight that God is the one that changes the times and seasons, removes kings and installs kings. I think this is going to be very much the underlying tempo of this book. This book is going to reveal to us the rise and fall of worldly powers as ordained by God, culminating with the Messianic kingdom, which is the pebble that destroys all of this and fills the whole earth, the stone. Um, and I think this is what the Lord is quoting at his ascension when the disciples gather around him and they say, will you you know, establish the kingdom of Israel now? And he says, well, it's not for you to know the times and seasons that God has set for these things. I think he's, he's literally pointing them to this passage and to the book of Daniel. Josh, you're muted. You're muted, Josh. <laughs> well, let me jump in then. No, just kidding. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, what Ali was uh, touching on is very is very true, and also is why do you do you think that's why they didn't have it in that in those in the set of books because it is mostly about Gentile prophecy. I think so. I think okay. that that was the because that's the really the main division I see. The other prophets speak of 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 the history from the point of view of Israel. This is. is the, you know, this is what's going to happen to Israel. This one's going to happen in Jerusalem. But then this book comes, and then in Aramaic, the language of Gentile world power, it's like English of the time, and switches the camera angle to the imperial forces. I think that's the distinction. And, and uh, I feel like also Jewish prophecy is pattern, and Gentile prophecy is prediction and fulfillment. So if you see a lot of that's like Daniel, he, like as like Joseph was uh, back in Egypt, rose of power. Rose of power in two times in, in uh, two big nations that that are uh, powerhouses at that time, and I feel like that's a huge accomplishment for anybody. You probably knew several different languages. This guy was the man. He's like, that's that's awesome. I I don't think I could ever do that. And I love how Daniel was given all glory to God every single time. He would never said that he's the one that would would interpret the the dream. He always gave all glory to God, which I love that. That was amazing. So next up, uh, your thoughts, uh, Derek, on on Daniel chapter two. Well, as you know, we kind of look at some of the weird things of uh, of the Bible, and and certainly Daniel chapter two, which focuses on the dream of Nebuchadnezzar of this amazing statue. The head of the image was fine gold, chest and arms of silver, middle and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And a lot of the, the folks in our you know alternative Christian milieu will look at the, uh, the feet of iron and clay because of Daniel's uh, interpretation or the interpretation that was given to Daniel as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay. And, and the rest of the statue, by the way, the head of gold referring to Babylon, that's pretty clear. The chest and arms of silver, probably the Medo-Persian Empire, the middle and thighs of bronze, Greece, although some will split Media and Persia and uh, make Persia the, the bronze, and then the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay, Greece and or Rome. Uh, I tend to go with Rome as the, uh, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay. But a lot of us uh, looking into the, uh, the Nephilim, these hybrid giants who were created in uh, the pre-flood era will look at the those feet and say, "Ah, this must be a a, a prophecy of um, the return of these hybrids." Just as uh, you saw iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together. Just as iron does not mix with clay, that's speculative. What I think is even more interesting than that, however, is when you look at the um, the writings of the Greek poet Hesiod, who would have been just before the time of Daniel, Daniel was taken off to Babylon around the year 605 BC. Um, he was still there when the 
Babylon, Babylonian kingdom fell in 539 BC. So by then he was an old man. Um, Hesiod probably was a contemporary with Isaiah in the 7th century BC. And he also wrote about the various ages of man, the age, the golden age when Kronos ruled in heaven. And then there was an iron age that followed, or rather a silver age that followed where humanity uh, were not quite as uh, developed as the men of the golden age. And then a bronze age uh, where uh, people had become more violent and warlike in the iron age, which was the current age in which Hesiod wrote that he lived, where times were tough and the gods made, uh, made the lives of men miserable. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we've got the same metals in the same order in the prophecy of Daniel with the true interpretation. And uh, interestingly enough, that golden age that was referred to by Hesiod, um, also the poet Homer, there's a phrase used for the men of that age that a scholar named Amar Anus has shown actually derives from the Semitic root word behind the word Rephaim. In other words, the men of the golden age, the pre-flood era, the demigods like Perseus and Heracles were Rephaim or Nephilim. The Greeks knew it and they knew that when those people died, their spirits became daemons, except they thought they were good. Anyway, that to me is the interesting takeaway. I mean, we can argue and scholars have for the last 2,500 years as to what exactly is meant by this final kingdom and uh, what the feet of iron and clay are. Um, and I don't know that there's an answer that we're all going to agree on. Um, we, it hasn't been settled in 2,500 years. I doubt we'll settle it tonight. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, I, I tend to sit, tend to see the iron and mixing with miry clay, uh, as more of a, a political thing rather than a return of a hybrid race. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I like how it's, it's also, it's gold, um, as it goes down, it's like more precious of a metal, but it's a stronger metal as well. So it's like almost the empires get stronger as you go down the statues is, is also another thing I noticed. But uh, all right, next up, uh, Gary Wayne, go ahead and uh, give your take on, on Daniel chapter two. Yeah, Daniel two is an awesome chapter, no doubt about that. And uh, I'll, I'll underscore what you're saying about and what Ali was talking about to a certain degree in terms of being speaking from outside the land of Israel and doing the prophet in the belly of the beast or the metallic empires, as I like to call them in Daniel too, um, and giving a perspective of talking to one of the beast kings or the first of the metallic empires. I mean, we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar is almost like an antichrist sort of archetype and the great statue is a giant statue. <laughs> I mean, it's just you can't get any more. Of, uh, if you if you want to look at the style of the not the style, but the kind of the writing of the things that are being described, and then you match that up with the the understanding that these polytheist metallic beast empires would understand in terms of gold, silver, bronze iron and then iron and clay which is something a little bit different at the end and and, and very much akin to what uh, Derek was talking about is there's this degradation in terms of it, it is in terms of their demi godly godliness type of thing if I can put it that way from a polytheist sort of perspective and their bloodlines as they're intermarrying because they have to to have their bloodlines survive as being descendants of the Raphaim after the flood, they, those bloodlines are diluting, which I think is part of that sort of allegory in, in, in the reflection uh, of the metallic empires and that they're going to commingle their seed, you know, with the children of humans in the end time. And you could, you could look at that as, as into a number of ways, just as you've got clay and iron, and I think it's telling us a number of things in how people interpret those allegories that a lot of them probably are are partly true. I mean, we're going to have probably two separate kings or kingdoms at the end, an east and a west, uh, for example, because they're on separate toes. You have the descendants of the bloodlines or reintroduced royales that are going to commingle with clay or humans. And you've got all of this sort of going on in 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 the book of daniel and what i also find you know very very interesting about 
you know, Daniel 2 is, is it sets down the beast empires that are going to be talked about in Daniel 7, but as the metallic empires here of all of the empires going forward and not really discussing the other ones, but is going to give another option for who those other uh, two empires are in Daniel 8. And I think both are will be true when we when we get to that. So this is laying down a template to put the other prophets prophecies into as you go through the book of Daniel. Daniel 2 starts that template, that chronology and things to anticipate. So this is a template that is not only going to be used in the time of Babylon and then in the second temple period, but it's a template that the Christians are going to now accept into it. And it's going to be a template that we can arrange revelation into or over top of, but both as Jesus would guide us in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke um, 17 and, and 21, where he provides the chronology and the abomination at the midpoint of that last seven years as described in, in later books in, in, in Daniel. But if we start to use that reference that Jesus said to, to learn about Daniel, we start to understand his chronology a lot more and this is the beginning of that chronology to understand the future events and in particular to what we would be concerned with the end time because we've seen the other empires come along so this is the this this is what i would call an earth-shattering prophecy delivered to the one of the terrible ones, Nebuchadnezzar, while they're in the belly of the metallic empire or the belly of the beast, so to speak, to an archetype beast king. So just an awesome passage or chapter. All right. That's awesome. Um, and, and I also, the, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, Josh, but I want to touch on the Mary Clay. The, the Mary Clay, it, I learned that it's the clays, that Mary type of clay is made from dust, and dust is the idiom of death. So Rephaim means dead, right? It means the dead ones, right? And so that's what that's why I, I studied that. So uh, I just want to touch on that. So if okay, it does have to do, I feel like, with the chronologically of yep. the and and the and the clay or the dust or the dirt that was used mostly for pottery as well. So it's got all of those sort of different meanings. And you know, the red clay, which this is, has a connection to you know Adam and all the different meanings. There's I think there's three or four different Adam versions, and one of them is red clay so i think there's a connection to the atomites in that in that allegory but to what people i think get sort of get stuck on it and i'm sorry for jumping in here uh is that they focus on one that makes sense but a lot of times the bible has multiple things we that are in there that we want to consider they're all true and they all work in harmony mm, amazing also i noticed in daniel 5 uh they're, they uh, they drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, brass, iron, wood, and stone. So they have those are different gods as well. But uh, next up, I would like uh, Jamie to go ahead and give his thoughts on Daniel chapter two. Yeah, man, thanks. I mean, it, it's it's a loaded thing when you're looking at all the depth and breadth of the different things that are going on just within the singularity of this one chapter. But uh, you know, you, you can look at it. There's there's uh, a particular elk that comes at it from the transhumanistic perspective, right? The bloodlines, the seeds of serpent versus the seed of woman, the alchemical processes that the adepts, the global elite, uh, the mystery schools of mystery religions all the way back, Sumer, Phoenicia, the Canaanitic mystery schools, are, right, are all trying to achieve this intermixing, this intermingling. But what I see even more is kind of like a childlike faith, right? That's how I always read the word, just straight up childlike faith. It's like... The language is very particular that it's not necessarily some uh, overarching hyperbolic idea of a transhumanism intermixing and the diluting of the blood, right, of the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. But more it's about a disunity, right? It's centered on this disunity that no matter that what, they won't be unified. But that's just a singular example of what's going on in chapter two. But what, there's so many types and shadows in here. And what I see... Uh, laid out in chapter two super plainly is is more than anything is the parallels 
with the book of Revelation, the parallels with the with the uh, tribulation period, the tribulation time. And I see this this ongoing cosmic warfare of the battle of the worship of images, right? We know Christ is the image of God veiled in flesh versus here it says a dazzling, enormous statue, the image of this, the image of that, right? We go into, and, into chapter three, the image of this is created and they marvel after the image of these things. And we see that secondarily in the book of Revelation that they will marvel after the image of the beast that's given them the power to speak from the false prophet, right? And it, it, it even triggers... Um, you know, current events with that statue coming out from that company company out of Ireland, that giant statue, it's called The Giant, right? It's 12 stories tall. It's AI infused. It's covered in all kinds of lights. It's enormous and it's dazzling image that's given the power to speak through AI algorithms. Same thing here, same thing in the book of Revelation, same thing that we see in our corporal reality that we can point to. But to me, when I read chapter two, I mean, obviously it's enigmatic, right? There's all these really cool, awesome things going on. The Lord is so faithful to lay out the mysteries for his people to know and understand, you know, let those with ears to hear, hear what the spirit is saying to the churches, right? And it gives us these guideposts and these signposts and aligns our hearts to him too. It teaches us to fear the Lord, knowing that he is the God of gods, the Yahweh Elohim, the Elohim of Elohims, who does tell the end from the beginning. That's the singularity of what separates him from all the lesser gods, all the small g gods, right? All the rebel hordes, all the insurgences. He affirms over and over again that because I tell the end from the beginning, that's why I'm supreme. That's how I assert my supremacy over all these things. But to me, the centrality and the power of chapter two is the rock that crushes the feet, the rock. Christ Jesus, you know, it says, look to the rock from which you were cut, the quarry from which you were hewn. It says a rock not cut by human hands comes and smashes the feet. And, it, and if you notice, it's the same language we see all throughout scripture. It's a suddenly and it's in an instant. It's the suddenly in an instant. There's no, you know, slow amalgamation of these, of this final government. There's no you know, oh yeah, it's going to fizzle out or fizzle up or grow up or grow down. It's like, it's on the scene and it's suddenly an instant in a single day, in a single hour, all the different language, right? From, from Isaiah and Jeremiah and Revelation and elsewhere. It's just done. The rock crushes the feet and the ten toes and the ten kingdoms, again, types and shadows of Revelation. And it's just done. And it says from this point on, no more. Like no more. The so the singularity, I always come back. What's the what's the singular? The singularity is the supremacy of Christ. The singularity is always the supremacy of Christ. And it's like, do your worst. That's what I always see God like to, to the rebel hordes. Like, do your worst, bring it. You know, we have that in um, I can't even remember the chapter and verse where he's like, call them out. Come on, like, let's see what you guys got. Bring them up, call them up. Call, you know, um, sharpen your 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 plowshares and the swords. Make all your do whatever you can. All you bring out all the gods and and all the great generals and all the mighty men. Let them raise their weapons skyward. Come on, do your worst. My rock will crush you in an instant. And to me, that is like the affirmation of the hope of the resurrection, the hope of glory, and the supremacy of the culmination of Genesis to Revelation is that we win, they lose, because Christ won, they lost. So that that's what I get out of it. Awesome. All right, hopefully I'm not muted. All right, so next up, Bible Mysteries, Scott Mitchell. What's up, brother? Go ahead, man. Hey, listen, I love what all these gentlemen have said. And Jamie, I couldn't agree more with you that the the pivotal point of chapter two or the or the way the, the dream and vision ends is the stone cut without hands destroying all these kingdoms. So he, he's absolutely right. And I agree that Christ is the focus of all of that. And what's really interesting is that the chapter ends with Nebuchadnezzar himself falling down and worshiping the God of Daniel because of that truth and uh and it's interesting, you know, Ali made the point about it being such a Gentile-focused history, even the language of Aramaic. And uh, as far as I know, this is the only um, book in the in all of Scripture that a Gentile actually wrote a chapter in. Uh, I believe Nebuchadnezzar wrote chapter four, which we're not going to discuss tonight. <clears throat> but the very point that he did, and and uh, you know, was punished for he, after seeing all this turned around, and we see him turn in with the heart of a beast later. But I, I think my takeaway from chapter two is also this, 
that if we're in agreement, and I, I am with uh, certainly with Derek about the kingdoms being uh, foreshadowings of Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, that Rome is that final kingdom with the ten kings, and um, when the stone comes to destroy that kingdom, it's a Roman Empire. So my belief is that this is a for, foreshadowing that the final kingdom of the Antichrist is a is a resurgent a Roman Empire, and I say that because. Just as in Matthew 12, when Christ was uh, uh, accused of casting out devils by Beelzebub, and he gave his story about blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, the very next chapter, he begins to preach in parables. And he'd never done that until that blasphemy. So when the disciples asked him, why do you speak this way? He said, unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So we're talking about mysteries here in Daniel. The kingdom of heaven message of Christ went into mystery form there in Matthew 13. And I believe Satan, who emulates God, put his Roman Empire in mystery form. And we now live in the mystery Roman Empire. I believe it's been that way since Rome was split and fell. Uh, but I don't really think it fell. I think it went into mystery form. So that's my takeaway of chapter two. Awesome. That's amazing uh, information there, guys. And uh now, next up, okay, so everybody that's listening, if you guys want to dig into, uh, you know, dig into chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, chapter six, okay, make sure you guys dig into those. There's, there's super important stuff and all that. But uh, for this show, for time purposes, we're going to jump into chapter seven, okay? And we're going to start out chapter seven with Ali. Go ahead. We're going to keep it in the same order as we go. That but, would yeah, make it can I just easy. Um, add a few things? Could I add a few things about chapter two before we move on? Because oh, please. as everyone was speaking, there's some very important points were brought up and I see that we're kind of diving into the deep end right away. So I want to um, add a few points that I think are pertinent to the conversation about eschatology. Um, so as far as the, the passage about the mixing of metal and clay, um, that is very important, I think. Um, I like the King James translation when it comes to that verse. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And the they is the masculine uh, plural pronoun. And, um, you know, when I made this documentary, UFOs, Angels, and Gods, Chuck Missler and other people were really interested in the whole abduction phenomenon where people say that they're being abducted and hybrids are being created, which sounds very strange. Um, but when you look into it, you realize, wow, there's a lot of truth into this. And the idea of hybrids are not a modern idea. They're actually an ancient idea. They go back to the days before the flood. So once you place that in the biblical worldview, it's not so strange, actually. It's something that's been going on for a long time. And so people started to think, well, the seed of the serpent um, and the seed of the woman, going back to Genesis chapter three, that there's going to be a eschatological conflict, you know, between this, this Goliath, which is the story of David and Goliath, perhaps is a type of the final uh, culmination battle between the Messiah and the Antichrist, who, who in this case would be like a Goliath. Um, and the next verse after the mixing of the of the clay and iron, it says, now in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. So this out of this mixing comes the 10 kings. So it's important to, to kind of make that connection. Now, is this mixing, is the modern day hybrid phenomenon, is it going to eventually, is going to be a hybrid of Satan himself, or is it um, more like a bloodline that comes through, you know, the kingdoms like Gary's uh, uh, suggesting. And and that kind of ties into the parable of wheat and tares, that, you know, God planted his seed in the garden. And while he was sleeping, whatever that means, perhaps it was the Sabbath, the enemy came and planted his seed. And now the two seeds, they're connected together to the point where the angels can't separate it until the end of the age. And the tears, um, they run through history. They don't just appear at the end times. They run through history. So whether this is a mixing of ancient Nephilim lines, um, whether the people that are being abducted 
and out of whose blood hybrids are being created are maybe descendants of this bloodline. That's why they're good donors for this. Whether it's it's born of the modern phenomenon or from ancient bloodlines, uh, I think the jury is out on that because we're not, you know, right in the councils of darkness understanding what they're up to. But definitely, definitely what we're being told is that once again, there's going to be a Nephilim empire, an overarching, you know, like Gilgamesh, like Og, uh, like King Sion. There is going to be one more time where uh, there's going to be the, the this Nephilim empire. And as far as the Rome, Rome, I think that's very important. Uh, the, the fourth empire um, being Rome, what happens to Rome? Uh, Rome, the Lord said, well, in the Abrahamic covenant, God said that those who bless Israel, he'll bless, and those who curse Israel you know, will be cursed. He puts this protection, essentially, around Abraham, because the Abrahamic covenant is a blessing to all the nations, and God is going to protect his, his work. And so when Rome shatters Jerusalem and destroys Jerusalem and scatters the Jewish people, in some ways, Rome itself gets scattered and shattered into many different heads. And, and we see as the Holy Spirit goes into the nations, the imperial, there's there's these attempts, you know, what's starting with Charlemagne, these attempts for Rome, you know, to, to rise again, Napoleon, and, and the sign of the eagle of Rome continues to dominate the flags. And for me, modern day Rome goes from DC to uh, Moscow. It's still in the in, in that Amen. industrial world where uh, the biggest armies are, the most advanced science and technology lies, the greatest economic power, the most important political influence. And then they tie into the more ancient Middle Eastern empires, like the Persian Empire. They, they each have hooks into that old empire. And, and so if, if we're going to look for the Ten Kings, that's going to be one of the next prophetic uh, signposts. And if they're going to emerge from Rome and and from the the, the the countries that bear the sign of eagle, then what we should start to see is some sort of a a coalition of type, and perhaps even this war with Ukraine and what is happening to Russia as a result of it, perhaps you know will lead us in 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 that direction. And and of course, the, the, another question is: Are these kings like national leaders? Or are they oligarchs like uh, some of the very wealthy people that we see today that have huge influence over the world but don't have political office? That that remains to be seen. But I, I see Rome rising again uh, as a result of of um, this this fall of globalism and the rise of nation states of powerful. Uh, nation, modern nation states from DC to Moscow. I'm looking into Europe and into that part of the world. So for me, the East and the West, um, when you look at the fall of Constantinople, uh, what happens? The uh, the power uh, of Christianity, you know, goes to Moscow, and the Byzantium, the double-headed eagle of Byzantium, gets adopted by the czars of Russia, and that's what we see today on the flag of Russia. And the uh, the princess of the House of Byzantium marries into the czars of Russia, and the czar of Russia declares Moscow the third Rome, you know, because you have the first Rome, Rome, the second Rome, Constantinopolis. So in a way, Eastern Rome, I think, goes in the Slavic sphere of power. And so Western Rome is manifested today by the power uh, of Washington D.C. and Eastern Rome. I think maybe is 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 Moscow, and I think that's how I see the modern kind of manifestation of Rome. So what that's what I'm looking at is is the industrial world uh, uniting into a coalition, uh, dominating the rise of China and the kings of the East, and and tapping into the more ancient empires of the Middle East. I don't see a power structure coming from the Persians or anywhere in the Middle East that's going to rival the power of the industrial nations. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we got that. Now we ended chapter two completely. So uh, we can jump into chapter seven now. Uh, Ali, if you want to start with your, uh, with your take on chapter seven. Sure. Why don't we go to Derek since I've spoken enough and, and I'll no, come back. No problem. Go ahead, Derek. <laughs> This is the, uh, the vision of the four beasts, which is um, echoed in uh, in the book of Revelation. Um, 
this, uh, it, I think it's interesting in a lot of these uh, prophetic books, by the way, that uh, the, the prophets will timestamp the visions for us. The first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, and Belshazzar, of course, was the uh, regent. The actual king of Babylon was Nabonidus, his father. Uh, but the first year of the, the regency of Belshazzar would be around the year 550 BC. So Daniel was middle-aged um, by this point. He'd been in, uh, in Babylon for 55 years and been taken as a young man. So he was you know, you know, middle-aged, I guess, but in, in those days, probably uh, considered a pretty old man. Um, his dream was uh, four great beasts coming out of the sea. The first, a lion with eagle's wings. The second, a lion or second beast like a bear raised up on one side and three ribs in its mouth between its teeth and told arise devour much flesh a third uh, a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it after this i saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong um it had great iron teeth it devoured and broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet it was different from all the other beasts that were before it and had 10 horns this probably a recapitulation of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, where we're looking at the four kingdoms again, the lion with eagle's wings, probably representing Babylon, the bear representing Media or Media Persia, the leopard with four wings and heads, um, probably representing either Persia or Greece, depending on where you want to divide the, uh, uh, the kingdoms there. And then the ten horned beast with iron teeth, Greece or Rome, I lean towards Rome as the interpretation there. Um, one area where I, I think Sharon and I may have a little different view on this is we believe that these 10 kings that uh, come about in the end times are not human kings. These are not human rulers. I think we're dealing with supernatural entities here. They're trying to divide up the earth under the headship of, um, uh, under the headship of, of Satan, who by the New Testament period certainly has a kingdom. Jesus makes that clear in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 26, he's accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, Baal the prince. And Jesus says, if Satan casts out demons by his own power, how will Satan's kingdom stand? So Baal, the storm god, who was the chief god of the Canaanites, was Satan. So Baal, who was Zeus to the Greeks, Jupiter to the Romans, um, chief god of their pantheon. Uh, when we're looking at Rome, I think we're looking at the, the realm of, that is subject to uh, Zeus, Jupiter, Baal, which would certainly be all of Western civilization if we consider ourselves the inheritors of Greco-Roman philosophy, law, literature, art, et cetera. Um, even though we've been Christianized, I, I think we can still say that we are Rome in the sense that, I mean, you just look at our architecture. All of our government buildings look like, look like pagan temples. And that's by design, in fact, I wrote about this in my book. Um, the reason the United States Capitol O-L is spelled Capitol O-L, uh, the place where our Congress meets, is because Thomas Jefferson, insi Thomas Jefferson insisted on naming it after the Temple of Jupiter in Rome, the Capitolium. So, until 1799, when it was built, there was only one building on planet Earth where a legislative body met in a building called the Capitol, and that was in Williamsburg, Virginia. And now we've got, what, like 38 of our 50 states here in the United States where our legislatures meet in a capitol. It's named for the Temple of Satan in Rome. This is not by, I, I don't think this is, now, I don't think Thomas Jefferson was a Satan worshiper, but I think he was being whispered to by principalities and powers and cosmic rulers over this present darkness. The other thing that's really interesting here in Daniel 7, we could do like the rest of this program on Daniel chapter 7, in my view. This small horn who appears in Daniel uh, 7, verse 8, uh, comes up among the ten horns. A little one comes up before which three of the first horns are plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Most end times prophecy scholars or students will, uh, will argue or agree that this is the Old Testament representation of the Antichrist. However, scholars also look at this and... Uh, argue that there are some similarities that are probably not coincidental between this little horn speaking great things and the depiction of Typhon, the chaos monster in the Greek religion. Now in the fake news version, which is what the Greeks and the Romans learned, their storm god, Zeus slash Jupiter, defeated Typhon, this monster of chaos, the equivalent of Leviathan. 
with great difficulty and with the help of other gods. Of course, in the Bible, we know that uh, Leviathan chaos was subdued very early in the creation process, will ultimately be defeated. Isaiah 27 verse 1 prophesies that. I think Revelation 21 verse 1, when the sea is no more, the sea being the Old Testament representation of chaos, is done away with. I think that's when chaos, Leviathan, is finally subdued. But uh, it, th this is why, one of the reasons why, I believe the spirit that indwells the human we call Antichrist is actually chaos, Leviathan. And we see this in Revelation chapter 13 when the seven-headed uh, chimeric entity emerges from the sea. Again, the representation of the bottomless pit, the representation of chaos. Uh, this is exactly how the chaos dragon in ancient Mesopotamia was represented. So I think here in, in Daniel chapter 7, We've got a clue as to the identity of the Antichrist. I believe it is chaos, Leviathan, in Scripture. The other thing that's really fascinating here, and I'm trying to condense this because Sharon and I have done like multiple programs on this. You can't really do this justice, and I want to give you guys time to, to comment on this, is that when the, uh, this little horn, the Antichrist, makes war with the saints and prevails over them, the word translated saints in verse 21 of Daniel 7 is Kedeshin. That is the same word that is applied to the watchers in Daniel chapter 4. These angelic beings who come down and basically say to Nebuchadnezzar, hey, because you're a jerk, we've decided to punish you by driving you crazy for seven years. So I think what we're seeing in Daniel chapter 7 is a description of war in the heavenlies. We always assume that the word saint means holy humans who are faithful to God, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of Jesus Christ. But I think the word that Daniel uses here, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, we assume, is the same word that applies to these supernatural beings, the faithful watchers who descended and decreed judgment on Nebuchadnezzar. So this horn, the Antichrist, makes war against the faithful angels and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. And then we read down in, Gen, in 26, verse 26, an, a little more exposition on this. The court shall sit in judgment. The court shall sit in judgment. Which court? The, the, wait, is, this is the divine council in action. The court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. And again, that word saints is used of the supernatural beings in Daniel chapter 4 who decreed judgment on Nebuchadnezzar. There's more supernatural stuff happening. I mean, Daniel 7 is already one of the most astonishing chapters in the Bible just packed with supernatural meaning. But I think there's more here than we've been taught. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, so so next up, we're going to go with Gary. Go ahead. And thank you so much for that, too. That was that was amazing yes. stuff. Go ahead, Gary. That was really good, Derek. Good job. Yeah, and I'll, I'll underline a couple of things that uh, Derek was saying, <laughs> that the saints we need may have to look at as more than just the people of Judah at that time, or the lost people of Israel, or the Christians, and that it could certainly be the loyal angels, the mighty ones that the book of Isaiah talks about in the end time. And so I think if we look at that in conjunction with Revelation 12 and the war, and we look at that with Daniel 8 that we'll get to next when Antichrist actually storms heaven probably with the other angels and brings down some of the starry host we have to be understanding the possibilities that might be at play here and that we have a difficult time imagining the type of things were, that would be seen if we're here for this period of time i don't think it's possible to describe some of the preternatural things that are that are going to go on and it's going to be absolutely unbelievable with massive disinformation and misinformation that's being poured all over us to to deceive us so i really liked what uh, derek had underlined there and when i look at daniel 7 i agree with derek as well that the bible doesn't leave things to chance 
And so you are seeing a different format to the same prophecy in Daniel 2 that reaffirms the nature of these beast empires, as they're now called in, in the book of Daniel, and that it adds more information and will continue to build on information, which is, again, a typical M.O. of the Bible and prophecy. It's not in conflict. It adds more information. And if you sort of guide for the listeners, if they kind of guide themselves in that sort of understanding, it it, it kind of helps. And one of the things that is interesting is there's four beasts there, but yet we're told there's seven kings of beast empires. That is the formation of the end time one. That suggests that there may have been perhaps either um, empires before Babylon, a couple, and or as as if you're matching up Daniel 8, you might come to the same number. I think it's both. And I also find it interesting that the bear, Persia, means it has three ribs. I think Persia eats in that sort of allegory, um, Babylon, Assyria, and Egypt. And that the beast empires, uh, if you add those in, now will number seven with the Antichrist going to be the eighth empire, as, as we learn in the New Testament, because he's going to grow amongst these 10 kings of the end time. And then he's going to overthrow three of these kings, and he's going to usurp power with uh, very, very few people. So when we look at uh, this uh, this understanding of this unicorn that's going to come up that's a separate empire. And I think we should be careful with that word unicorn, and it's not a well-translated word for the Bible, to say the least. It's more, I think, it was sort of representing what some other people are imagining for Antichrist and in terms of their allegories, but I'll leave that, that sort of sit because um, I, I don't want to get distracted. Um, but these beast empires are... Um, you know, part of seven, and that beast empires tend to have a relationship with Israel and Judah. And so we need, and if we want to sort of look at that as it comes through the history of the Holy Covenant, the history of the people that were born in Egypt, and then great things happen to free them, and terrible things happen. It goes from good to bad. But anyways, that's where they're grown into a nation. And then Assyria is the one who comes to apply the punishment for both the northern and the southern kingdom except that the southern kingdom will be spared because they, they will repent and so they're taken into exile and dispersed into the nations until until the end time and babylon you know it takes judah into exile and i won't go through all of them and and, and derek had talked earlier about i think it was derek who had mentioned it that rome destroyed um Jerusalem and disperse the people of Judah. So yes, Rome is this empire that is is in the mix in the understanding of, of the end time. But all of the all of the empires are in the mix. When somebody was talking about the architecture, we have more than just Roman architecture. We have Greek architecture. We have Egyptian architecture. We have Persian and Babylonian architecture. We have that amalgamated beast system all over the world. And it's the system that is imposed by the visible ones for the invisible ones. We should expect that, that this would be a beast empire system. And they have the same sort of class system that was all over the world, the same type of royal bloodlines, the same type of beast polytheist religion. And with all of these beast empires, you have that beast religion that will be there in the end time as well. It's not specific. It's not talked about it in, in, in the book to to a large degree but it's part of that organizational structure that is going to be coming back to play in the end time so we have this same prophecy that's adding more information but now the ten toes are ten kings ten kings of some sort of greater global end time empire that will probably have an affiliation with rome somehow just by sort of implication, uh, even though it may have two centers to it because it's on 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 uh, extending out of two legs on two feet with ten, 10 toes, five on each. And so there could be two halves to it, just like the Roman Empire was. 
as what was mentioned er earlier with Constantinople and the city of Rome. So we might want to imagine that on a global scale. So an empire of 10 empires, each having an empire of multiple countries. And we might see that if we're in the fake tree generation, we might see that sort of lining up. You've got China and Russia. And, you know, that's going to form a lot. You've got India, who is buying all of their resources from Russia and that they have not talked against the the Ukrainian war that's going on. And of course, that Kievan bloodline of the Tsarist Empire is, is a pure bloodline, which is why the Western Europeans wanted that bloodline overthrown, just as they sent, I think, communism to China to do the same thing with the Shah dynasties to, to get rid of the uh, the major sort of rivals. And Gomer is likely Germany, I think, and they're going to have to go with Russia. I think we start to see that that emergence starting to form. I mean, I'm not going to try and predict the, the complete um, who those five kings are or anything like that, but I think we start to see that sort of shift that, that's coming into play if we're in the fig tree generation, and I, I do think that we are, and we're going to see more of this shift that, that that's going on. So uh, I look at Daniel 7 as another extraordinary empire that now takes you into Revelation with the same type of beast uh, imagery, and this end-time empire is representing all of these sort of aspects of those beast empires. Uh, and I think we want to uh, understand it as, as a global nature. And I think it's going to be not quite how a lot of people might think it's going to sort of form. I think it's going to try and form. But I, I think that the Babylon religion has to come first because it's going to be the glue and it rides the beast of empires and we see this beast of empires in revelation uh, 12 13 and 17 all with the same description and one of them is in revelation 12 below the woman it's the red dragon i think it's giving you an imagery of, of satan's beast empires wanting to destroy israel and the messiah from the face of the earth which is sort of all part of that information you need to understand what's going on in the book of revelation and revelation 12 in particular but again it's you get on it you get on a uh a rant on this and you could go forever there's just it's so juicy with materials and i just wanted to sort of lay that down in terms of the additional part the beast empires and that it is an affirmation of daniel 2 and we're going to see more expansion on this information as daniel book of daniel unfolds Awesome. Amazing stuff. Everybody's doing so amazing. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, next up would be Jamie Walden. Yeah, man. When it, you know, I, I'll try to, uh, um, for brevity's sake, keep it short, but you know, I look at, you know, even the, the different dimensions of the unseen realm, right. And the, Satan being the prince of the power of the airs. And I, you know, I don't want to rehash things that, um, Derek already laid out so eloquently, but when we look at, the rise of what the adepts, what the mystery schools, the occultists would say is the the rise of the Atlantean age, you know, based on Plato's writings and others, you know, Sir Francis Bacon, Adam Westhop, all these different guys. And even what the different mystery schools teach is that there will be a restoration of the antediluvian pre-flood era with the demigods ruling and reigning over 10 super districts on the face of the earth, right? These these. 10 god men for lack of the men of renown the the golden age of the gods read turn to the golden age of the gods and why that's interesting in particular is because um the global elites currently speak openly about this reductionism of borders this reductionism of cultures and nationality and nationalism all of these different things reductionism of the different currencies and the mechanisms for international you know exchanges and things like that on on a wholesale industrial level about the restructuring of the globe which they did with the league of nations right world war one then world war two they get the united nations then world war three which we're on the brink of they will finally have the global collective dramatic experience to create a hive mind type of mentality to roll out what would be the re-implementation of the golden age of the gods with these 10 kingdoms 
over which I believe there will be principalities working through men that will actually be the overlords of these kingdoms. So it's interesting that that's what they're saying. It's interesting that that's what the scripture says. It's interesting that that's what the antediluvian, you know, historicity points to. It's all pointing to the same exact thing. Um, secondarily, when I look at Daniel chapter seven, what what I think is fascinating, and also again, it's it's shadowed in the book of Revelation, is the disunity of the beast system. There's a disunification to it. There is. It is not this global this shared global experience where everybody's like la di da unified kind of you know i know the algorithms won't pick up on this word but with coronavirus as long as we don't mention other certain things is there was seemingly a global collective hive mind consciousness but there wasn't but there was but there wasn't but there was but there was there's warring factions right there's there's this unity there's there's backbiting there there's uh there's warring there's uh usurpation there's infiltrations there's these different acts of subterfuge that are happening and you see the same thing in this B system but here's what's the most particular why i always go the centrality the singularity of christ jesus that's where i'm always going to take it no matter what is that you see this chapter in daniel focus more so than almost anywhere else in all of the old testament on the saints and the people of god now i've never heard what derek said that's awesome that's profound but it but it mentions the saints and the people of the most high and the people of the most high like these guys are gonna rule and reign right we see that in malachi 4 and then we see that in in other scriptures we see that in the book of revelation like the time is coming where my people they will sit in judgment over all y'all rebels, you insurgents, you whatever, right? And this will be their kingdom. The one that you have painstakingly been seeking to usurp and corrupt from the foundations of it is going to be handed to them, just so you know what the final outcome is. And that that's very particular language that you don't see fully uh, extrapolated upon throughout the rest of, of the Old Testament in particular, but not till you get to the more eschatology-based scriptures of the New Testament is the finality of it all and this rule and reigning with an iron rod, you know, ashes under the soles of your feet. You will see it with your own eyes of the saints, of the people of God and the loyal angels, right? The loyal celestial beings in the heavenly host uh, glorifying God in that as as dominion. This is not dominion, preterism, amillennialism. I'm not saying that. The actual dominion, the true biblical dominion being handled over to the people of God at the appointed time. So that's a wrap on my end. Amazing. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, next up would be Scott. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I, I loved what you the way you just said that, Jamie. And I like that term singularity because that is what the Bible is. The focus is on Christ. And once again, in, in Daniel 7, we see the same thing. We see another telling, like uh, Gary's pointing out, of the of the the uh, amalgamation, I think is the word you use, of these kingdoms. Uh, and and that Christ, the ancient of days this time, the Son of Man coming to destroy that kingdom. And it's interesting to note that in Daniel 7, where we see the, the four different beasts, uh, in Revelation 13, we see one beast, which is a composite of all of them. There's that amalgamation, you know. Uh, I think that's because Daniel's writing from the standpoint of the future. They haven't occurred yet. The, they haven't yet a, appeared to be the uh, the other beasts, uh, the Greece and Rome. And then... Um, when John writes the revelation, it's already manifested. They, the, that history is over, and here they are in their rejuvenated uh, amalgamation, if I keep using that term. So it's a perfect picture of that blend of all those elements, like he was talking about, both architectural uh, and the religious aspect of it, starting with Babylon. Uh, and and I, too, had not heard uh, the the take on Derek about the saints, and but I have no problem with that. I think it's all of us. Saints simply means sanctified one, holy, and that would be true of, of one of God's angels as well as one of a, one of those that have trusted Christ. Because I think about, you know, Jude referring to the uh, Enoch prophesying that he comes, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment. And then also in uh, Psalm 149, that they're coming to execute judgment written, this honor have all his saints. And so I think that includes all of us. So we, we that are in Christ are there and we are saints of God. Uh, and Paul says we're even going to judge angels. I think we're judging the fallen ones. 
Uh, so I, I would agree with what Derek's saying there. You've expanded my whole take on that, Derek. So I thank you for that uh, introduction to that idea. But yeah, that once again, like I said, you see the Ancient of Days, you see the victory of Christ over all these kingdoms, no matter how they manifest, no matter how bad it gets, the victory is ours, the kingdom is ours. Amazing. All right. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it, Scott. Um, Ali, if you wanted to add, um, add on to uh, that, go ahead. A, chapter seven is interesting that isn't this vision of the four beasts is interrupted with this heavenly vision of the ancient of days often the lord referred to himself as the son of man and he was referring specifically to daniel seven thirteen, which uh the word son of man i was watching in the night visions behold one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven he approached the ancient of days and was brought into his presence dominion glory and sovereignty were given to him that all the people's nations and languages should serve him. And of course, in his dominion is an everlasting dominion. We now know who that is. As the Lord ascends into a cloud, we see here that he arrives to the ancient of days in a cloud. Uh, so where the glory carries him to the father and there are thrones because, you know, he has a, the God, the father has a throne, the son has a throne and there are the number of, of, of beings that are there, uh, thousands of thousands attended him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. It's interesting that, that Paul says that we're going to judge the angels. And so there is this government in the universe, in the cosmos, and uh, the Lord from the tribe of Judah, the son of David, the son of God, has ascended to the Father and has received authority, and he's on the throne right now. So even though we're hearing about these beasts, and even though we're hearing about this little horn and their attempt, we have this comforting word that the one who sits on the throne, Jesus Christ, is completely the uh, in command, is the one to whom the Father has given the whole of the creation. And that's, that's the situation right now. And uh, so it's interesting that that's uh, put in there in the middle of, of this discussion uh, about the beast empires. Um, the um, the little horn um, rising, I find it interesting, this idea that heavenly beings are being challenged by this little horn. And I kind of imagine how how is that going to play out? Is it going to play out in in this unseen realm, in this world of allegory this spiritual world it's somehow happening behind the scenes and we don't see it or is it going to happen in the world where we see where he makes fire come from the sky he does lying signs and wonders he makes some sort of a uh you know demonic connection and i think for the secular world that connection is is taking on the ufo uh shape today and he makes some sort of a connection with that and, and openly, because if you look at the culture, it's what the UFO phenomenon is pushing into the culture is that the saviors of the world have arrived, that they are the pseudo messiah. They, they are here to help us through with uh, environmental issues, uh, poverty, the, all kinds of things, disease, um, uh, wars, uh, the, they're enlightened and and the number of people that have buyed into it is very large. If you're in the church, you're not aware of how large it is. Uh, but globally, the number of people that belong to UFO cults and the little groups are not cults, but they, they're they interested in all of this and in their hearts and minds have already converted to the religion of UFO is huge globally. So could it be that, you know, he, he, he demonstrates power and, and then he launches, you know, an attack against uh, the angels of the Lord, and then this is this is like a like Star Wars, like this is a cosmic you know battle that we we see. It's not just in some the the traditional way that uh, the church has come to understand this is that there is a spiritual world and we don't really see it. But now that spiritual world is seeping through, and the war of angels is coming to the forefront because of the the day and age that we live in. And, and the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth are are colliding and coming together. We're, we're about to enter, you know, the messianic kingdom that's going to be established, I believe, on this very earth. 
uh, where the Son of God will reign from the city of Jerusalem, from the Temple Mount, uh, over the nations. And, and I think that's what the Bible clearly says. So as we're getting closer to that event, this war may be coming into our realm, into a very much a visible realm, and may play out in the clothing of UFOs. So, uh, final, finally, about the makeup of this uh, empire, when I look at the statue uh, and I look at the imperial uh, struggles of, of the nation of Israel, starting with the Abrahamic covenant and the war of 10 kings, but then really taking off in, into Egypt, um, I see that when you look at the Persian Empire, which conquers, as the, Gary said, the Mesopotamian empires and Egypt and basically becomes the dominant force of the Middle East before the Greeks come and take over, and then the Greeks lead to Rome, and I think Rome expands into, into Europe and into the colonies. Um, when you look at Europe and the colonies, and you look at the Middle East, and you put this together, you have the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. It doesn't involve, for me, China and India. For me, those are the kings of the East. Uh, like the book of Revelation says that the river Euphrates will dry for the kings of the East to come. Now, you might say, well, Persia is you know, uh, east of the Euphrates. But in the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, the Medo-Persian Empire is there and it conquers um, Babylon and all that Babylon holds. So if you look at the modern structure of world governance, the industrial uh, world um, essentially has its uh, hooks into uh, the Middle East. Some of the, uh, Persia currently is allied more with Russia, Egypt um, and Iraq, or you know, maybe is allied more with the United States. These allegiances can shift, as as there might be wars and revolutions that topple powers. But all, but you're still seeing that these ancient empires are not going to come to pre uh, eminence. They're going to continue to be hooked. So if you you unite the uh, industrial powers and hook them into this ancient empire, you really do create a power structure that no other part of the world uh, can overcome. The Chinese could not overcome. If, if Moscow to DC, through the European capitals, like let's say Germany, France, and England, and the Middle East, if, if let's say there's the Islamic Republic falls in Iran, and, and you know you look at the, the parliament of, of, of Iran, it is a pyramid with 33 windows. Um, there, there might be already, you know, a force there. So that that's looking past the Islamic Republic. If you see the old Persian Empire and the industrial world combine together, it will form a Middle Eastern Western Empire that China and India could not overcome. In fact, no other jurisdiction in the world uh, could overcome it. So I'm, I'm looking. That's where I'm looking for the emergence of the. Uh, East Empire. Um, yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ali. That was awesome. Now uh, we'll move into chapter eight. And uh, Derek, you're going to be first because we kind of switched it up a little bit now. <laughs> so, Derek, go <laughs> ahead and take over chapter eight. And, and J I'm sorry, Jason. Uh, did you have anything to say? I don't want to like leave you out either, bro. No, man. I'm I'm, I'm listening to this stuff, man. I, this is not a point for me to talk. This is, these guys are way okay. smarter and more well rounded <laughs> than I am. I'm. I studied I studied the book of Daniel a few times and this is this is there's some new information coming out that that I got from Derek and then and from uh and from Ali all, so all of them I'm, Jeez. yeah so I'm all just right. sorry about that so all right go I, ahead go ahead Derek no <laughs> worries um Daniel 8 thankfully is uh, something I think we can we can interpret pretty quickly because it explains itself it's the vision of uh uh, a ram standing on the bank of the canal with two horns. Both horns are high. One was higher than the other. The higher one came up last. Then a male goat comes from the west, um, flying across the ground without touching the ground. It says the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. Then the goat became exceedingly great. But when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And then four horns came up after it. And this is explained by Gabriel to Daniel. It's clear. I mean, the ram represents the Medo-Persian Empire. Um, the two horns, the kings of Media and Persia, the one who came up later, Cyrus, was the greater of the two. Then they were taken out by Alexander the Great, represented by the goat. He was the big horn on the goat. When he died, his kingdom was divided into four, uh, his four generals. And um, th again, that's that one is pretty easy. And uh, 
so I, I think this uh, that one, thankfully, I can uh, uh, I can you know shut up and move on and <laughs> pass it on to you fellas. <laughs> I think it's amazing because like this book is so precise on on places that it's so precise. I think that people might have thought it might have been written later. I, well, when, that's I the thing. Like, yeah. That, that is the thing that uh, scholar that uh, rather critics have, have leveled against the book of Daniel, that it is so precise, especially when you get uh, later into some of the prophecies of things that take place between the time of Daniel and the um, and the time of Antiochus, the uh, Epiphanes, the one who uh, desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. Um, critics will say this is this is so precise. There's no way it could have been done prior to. Uh, the the events that 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 took place, except for the fact that it was translated into Greek, you know, the Septuagint version, before some of those events took place. So we know that Daniel was written before some of the prophesied events occurred. And uh, this is something that Chuck Missler pointed out that really opened my eyes. Uh, one of the things he said that um, really got him to study Bible prophecy: the precision of prophecy is uh, undeniable and the book of daniel is proof positive of it it's so precise that actually the, the like liberal scholars or some scholars try to say yeah. that that it wasn't written by daniel and it, but, it's, you know but jesus authenticates that in the new testament so it's all good yeah about that. amen <laughs> yeah. um okay next up uh gary also we had ali ali took off because he's actually uh east coast time so next yeah. time we're going to start a little bit earlier Thank you, Ali. We love you, brother. And we appreciate you seriously, dearly. Thank you. Thank you. Time, All right, go, go ahead, Gary. Yeah, so the polytheists and the seculars have to say it's too perfect because they can't accept the Alpha Omega perfect all-knowing God, right? Just they can't. So they have to they have to attack the messenger. They have to talk, they have to attack the God of the Bible. That's just their standard sort of tactics. But why wouldn't you expect? such accuracy such specificity on things why wouldn't you if it was the 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 only god of everything why and that he knew the beginning of the end of course that would be that specific and again in typical prophetic and uh, biblical mo it is not leaving things to chance it is affirming daniel 2 and it's affirming daniel 7 and now we're taking a piece out of those beast empires, as what Derek was talking about, between per between Persia and and Greece as part of those two beast empires, and expanding on the information as to the Antichrist, the little horn that's going to rise, uh, the single horn as it now is understood in um, in Daniel eight for the end time. And that it is going to uh, perhaps, as some people might say, well, you know, Antichrist is going to come from Greece. Well, we want to be careful of that. It's the Greek Empire. <laughs> and as, as uh, Derek had explained, I mean, this Greek Empire included Rome all the way to India. <laughs> right? It was mm -hmm. huge. It included Egypt and it divided into four parts. And Rome is part of that. Rome comes out of the Greek Empire. Right. And so, again, it's it's interrelated. So we want to be very careful that somebody is, is saying that the Antichrist is going to be Greek or somebody, some people might say, well, he's the Assyrian. So therefore, it's going to come out of out of there. Well, that's an allegory in in the chapters for an individual. And it, it means that he's of the beast empires and, you know, they be more accurately stated to be, you know, something to do with Nimrod, the original Antichrist archetype figure of Babel, uh, who, you know, is kind of one of the patriarchs or is the patriarch of, uh, of the Assyrians. And that Babel is the root word for Babylon. As you take that back from Greek and, and into Hebrew. And so he would be sort of a patriarch to the Babylon Empire and the Persians are more Aryan as you take that bloodline in a different line of giants as they would say as the dark haired uh, giants like Gilgamesh or Nimrod as he's, he's sort of depicted as as opposed to the other types of giants and that this this uh, this depiction of the Greek uh, and the Persian Empire just 
leaves it very, very clear that this is talking about specific types of empires that had this world sort worldly sort of nature or known civilized world with the same kinds of beast religion that would have went along with it. So I think we want to be careful about getting too too far down the line. And as what I see a lot of people doing as to saying, well, you go to Daniel 8 to find out where the Antichrist is going to come from. We're going to have multiple Antichrists. <laughs> Jesus told us this, and it's reaffirmed in the epistles of, uh, of John. So we don't want to be pointing at each Antichrist figure that sort of comes along. But what we do know, it's associated with the beast empires. And I think just as Michael fights in the book of Daniel against the beast empires, not from them coming to power, but to restrain them, perhaps, to use that word as a possibility for restrainer, because I know there's two really good arguments, one for the Holy Spirit and one for Michael. I think you can make a good case for pay, for both. I used to be more Holy Spirit, now I'm more Michael. Michael is the one who refrains Antichrist from coming to power. So these are all beast empires with Antichrist type of figures, and Alexander might most closely represent the best scenario for an antichrist type figure of gaining power and his life is struck short and so i think when we look at the whole imagery of this is that antichrist is going to come through this beast system somehow some way we just don't know exactly where from so i like to not to get to sort of too specific on that but what it does do is, is it represents the same template. But we also get, as we were talking about, uh, you have the five empires of Greece, Alexander, and then the and then the four split, and then you have you know Rome thereafter, and then you have the end time empire, and you arrive at Antichrist being the eighth, or you can go the other way. It's not one or the other. What I've sort of learned is, is that it adds information and it's both because you're receiving more information to, to understand what is being laid down as the template and the prehistory that comes with it that is represented in the end time empire. And I think as Derek or somebody else said it, that we see this fully formed thing from a futuristic sort of perspective from as opposed to Daniel not seeing all of them but as one at a time coming up through the vision so all of that sort of makes sense to me and I think Daniel 8 is just like the cap on uh, putting this template together in terms of we have to be aware of the empires and this is a world empire that's coming and it's going to be have a significant relationship with Rome but with all the beast empires amazing okay uh next up jamie go ahead brother trying to unmute here yeah man i have nothing to add to that you know it's it's, it's just plain and and laid out so i'm good okay, okay no problem <laughs> next up uh scott if you have anything to add go ahead brother Really, I don't. Derek and, and Gary are clearly the uh, experts on this, but I, I, I will say this. I, I, I was surprised that uh, Gary mentioned that there are people that think that they can use uh, Daniel 8 to indicate the uh, Antichrist is coming from Greece. And I, I don't think I agree with you, Gary. I don't think we can pinpoint it that way. Um, and in fact, the only the only thing I thing I see that's even leaning in that direction in the chapter is that because we're getting more information like it's it's a little bit more unfolding about details we learned something specific about the greek and the persian empire uh and i totally agree with derek that the, the it's it's obvious it's not telling we don't have to guess you know media persia the two rams horns uh alexander seems to be the notable horn and then the four uh his kingdom is divided into four i suspect that's the four generals and and the closest i think you can possibly come to trying to pinpoint things is saying that maybe two of the generals are, are uh, Seleucid and Ptolemy, and he Ptolemy took the Egyptian region, if I get my history right, the, the southern, and Seleucid would be the Syria region to the north of Israel. It's always in juxtaposition to Israel, 
So I think uh, if anything, you might be able to say the king of the north could be related to the Seleucid Empire. But again, it's all tied together. And even later in Daniel 9, we're going to read the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's Rome. So you can't just pinpoint it into one thing and say, oh, it's a Seleucid Greek that's the Antichrist. You know, I, I don't believe we can do that. We're just giving some indications of maybe regions, bloodlines possibly, but uh, ultimately, and, and I keep harping on this, but I'm going to keep saying it. Once again, we see more details about that kingdom, but we also see in the end, it's always the prince of princes. He's going to stand up against him, but he'll be broken without hand. So we always see the victory in Christ. And we always see the no matter how much power, no matter how much this Antichrist uh, shouts against the host of heaven, his end is always going to be to be cast down and destroyed. Yeah, and another uh, a little horn. Some people believe it was the great Antioch, Antioch Epiphanes. Uh, he stopped the Jews from doing their daily sacrifice in the temple. He sacrificed a pig in the holies of holies. He spread the pig's blood all over the temple. He made the Jews eat the meat of the pig. He erected an altar to Zeus, which was an abomination of desolation, and he was killing uh, the Jewish people. So that's another one that that I heard from somebody. I don't know if you guys have any opinion on that. Uh, it almost looked like he was the Antichrist with uh, doing the abomination of desolation. Uh, it was really interesting. Does anybody have anything to add about him? I'll chip in on that. If somebody else want to go first, that's fine too. I was just going to make a quick comment that I, I think that's why some people claim it to be Greek. And and that's, I guess, what would that be? Preterists that, that yeah. uh, would, would declare that. But I've got... I got people sending me links to videos right now trying to prove King Charles is the Antichrist. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, there you go. we just there had a guy go. on the show. We just had a guy so, on the show that, that went over that. But anyways, I just so, wanted to add that just because. Yeah, different, I would uh, I would up. I would say this. I say, try and tell this to people when they're talking about that is it's it's similar akin to Nebuchadnezzar creating the image, which would be sort of an ancient sort of reflection or prototype of the end time teraphim beast um, uh, beast image um, it would be similar to uh, and, and having people come worship him it's it's similar and he didn't quite get over the top i mean he he went into the temple with his forces and they stole stuff and they desecrated the temple and destroyed the temple it's similar but that's not the abomination that is helping us to understand what Antichrist is going to do through the beast empires. This is a similar thing. It gets a little bit more specific for us to understand through another beast empire of Greece at this time, who is creating an abomination like, but it's not the abomination. And so what, what happens is that a lot of people in prophecy, for whatever reasons, like to leave out inconvenient passages to arrive at a preconceived conclusion. And so they have to, particularly with the preterist perspective, is, is they have to redefine what Jesus said. They have to uh, leave out a whole bunch of prophecies uh, that are in the New Testament because that doesn't fit. They have to leave out certain parts of Daniel, like the rise of Antichrist and the events that he does in Daniel 11, like the Antichrist horn rising amongst it. They have to leave all of that out to just sort of say, hey, the first three and a half years happened and there was a, some sort of event recorded in Josephus and stuff like that. Anytime, my advice to anybody that's listening is if people have to leave out inconvenient passages, that's a red flag. They need to find a way to make them work and make it work scripturally. Now, whether or not you agree with them on how they do it, at least they're not leaving scripture out because it doesn't fit their narrative. Awesome. I like that. Yeah, I just yeah, wanted to. And Josh, Josh, let me roll this grenade in the room real quick, talking about the abomination and desolation. A lot of people don't have their finger on the pulse. Uh, of what's going on but just the nature of the things that i do and i'm into and even being a pastor you know and just i don't know be, being out there publicly speaking and preaching and and speaking of things is the rise of the of core observance and hebraic roots type of narrative which the which in the the re-implementation 
of the Torah and the law and the legal writ and the dates and the times and the obligations and all these things that is this firestorm sweeping the Gentile world, which is mind boggling to me if they understood any rabbinical studies and what they would say about Gentiles taking back on these things. It's actually an impossibility for a Gentile to enter into being Torah observant. That, that is such an offense to uh, uh, the Judaizers and the uh, authentic Judaism. But um, what you see is the centrality of, or not the centrality, but one of the major themes of the Antichrist is basically this resurgence of an affirmation of the people of the covenant, right? This resurgence is the temple, the reinstitution of animal sacrifice, blah, blah, blah. And what I personally think, this is informed speculation, speculation, but informed speculation, I believe the abomination of desolation is the second they want the blood of an animal for the propitiation of sins instead in place of the blood of Christ. I think that there is no higher form of an abomination to the Lord God Almighty after having re revealed the mysteries of the covenant of the gospel, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the blood of his son to then come back around because of whatever this wokeism Christianity, this hyper truther movement thing that's like, I'm going to take on this and then I'm going to take on that and then I'm going to take back and then I'm going to take back on the law and then I'm going to be bewitched and then I'm going to, you know, abandon the faith and then I'm going to forsake the scriptures. Then I'm going to deny all the Pauline epistles because Paul was a homosexual. That was a thorn in his side. And then don't celebrate the resurrection because that's not an official feast day. You can only celebrate the Passover. If you're celebrating the resurrection, you're a pagan. I literally saw that posted by over 10 different people on social media who I'm personally friends with because this Torb Observant Hebraic Roots thing is sweeping the globe at a breakneck speed and the Antichrist will satisfy all of their deepest self-justification and self-righteousness that they're pursuing. They, he will satisfy it in a blink of an eye. The, the standing in the temple, they'll applaud it. The re-implementation of the changing the dates and times probably back to the Hebraic calendar versus the Gregorian calendar. They'll champion it and they'll, they'll leap for joy. And then, and then the re-implementation of the sacrifice of animals for their sins, I believe, is the abomination of desolation that the Antichrist will bring in. And it will be the greatest offense to the ancient of days and to the Lord God Almighty in his son, Jesus Christ, that they will grieve and weep and wail and moan, and they will speak woe over the inhabitants of the earth when it happens. Because awesome. the, the Jew has no atonement for sin right now, so they will be very happy exactly. for that. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That, yeah. yeah. And, and Jamie, I think, that actually, I good point, Jamie. I like that. Good point. I never thought of it. Well, that, that, that actually good. that actually fits my theory that I think that when the Antichrist manifests and and, and uh, is revealed, he will present himself to the world as a Jew. Yeah. Yes. And this was and how this... you would get the Jews to accept him as their uh, as their Messiah. But it would also, I think, uh, assuming that Christians are still on the earth in those days. Now, I, I am pre-tribulation, but sure, I'm willing yeah. to I'm willing to accept the, the possibility that I could be wrong. I've been wrong about some things before. <laughs> yeah. So if if Christians are here, I think there is a segment of Christianity that would welcome a, uh, a dynamic political yes. and military leader of Israel as the Messiah, and especially so if they are already indoctrinated by this Hebraic uh, Hebrew roots movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and this, think, get, I think, this gets I, into I, the, well, this gets into the other layer too, with the Noahide laws. I mean, the Noahide laws being central to, to the governing, you know, authority for lack of a better word of the United Nations. Also Bush Jr. Uh, subordinated the United States of America to the Noahide laws. And what's unique about that, again, we have this qualifier in scriptures that those who carry the testimony of Jesus Christ will be beheaded. They will be beheaded for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, it's like, where else do we see that language? Well, we see that contained within the Noahide laws. It's hmm. contained within the Noahide laws is this heretic, this heretical type of nature that they put upon those who believe in Christ Jesus for the sufficiency of their sins, the propitiation of sins, their justification, a righteousness not of their own, right? And, and all these different things that they will be beheaded for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Also, you see contained within that Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, you know, uh, 2 Timothy 2 and 3, or 3 and 4, and 1 Timothy 3 and 2 Peter 2. And, you know, it goes on and on. 2 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, that uh, uh, there is going to be this rampant 
apostasia, right? This official revolt or defection from the religious dogma you once held to be true. And it's talking to the church. All those letters are written to the churches. I don't need to remind you when I was with you, we talked about it all the time. We don't need to talk about it again. We always talked about it. Like, this is what you can anticipate. And the many, I always tell people, circle it in your scriptures. The many is you saw many will abandon the faith. Many will give devote themselves to the doctrines of demons. The way of truth will come into disrepute. They will not tolerate sound doctrine. They'll always be learning, never come to an understanding of truth. They'll be proud, boastful, arrogant, treacherous, rash, conceited, right? Like like lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They'll have the form of godliness. That is the law. They will have the form of godliness, but deny the power of it because Christ Jesus is the power of the gospel. So they'll have the, and, and so I see this culmination of scripture going on in real time in the antichrist, you know, as I know not to detract from what we're talking about in Daniel, he's going to actually with flattery deceive many and he's going to lead many astray and many to abandon the faith and many and they and then they will put you to death and believe they're doing God's work. Right. So it's hmm. all interconnected. I think uh, I don't know, Gary, did, I think you wanted to add something or should we go to chapter nine? Oh, I think you're muted, Gary. I think you might be muted. Yep. There you okay. go. For Perfect. some reason it was on mute. It should, was down. It should have been working. Sorry. Okay. Um, that's so couple of things is, yes, I think if people are going to accept, uh, particularly the people of Judah, the Antichrist as their Messiah, there has to be a pedigree there, whether it's bloodline, scion, and they're going to have to produce a pedigree that's going to accept them. But we want to be careful on the animal sacrifice thing, um, simply because he's going to Antichrist as part of the Daniel covenant in Daniel 9, which we haven't talked about. It's going to permit the sacrifice for the first three and a half years and then stop it. So that doesn't mean that Antichrist won't do something else that could be sacrifices for atonement after that would do that further abomination. But understand that that's going to be part of the first three and a half years and that Judah and Israel are going to be brought back into the covenant. So we want to be a little bit careful because they haven't recognized Jesus as their Messiah yet, but they will. And so I think... Um, when we look at Antichrist, is that he's going to he's going to counterfeit everything Jesus does. So he's going to have the power to atone, however he's going to do it. And also remember, he's going to have a mortal head wound, that he might fake a resurrection to do the same thing, and all of that's going to be wrapped into whatever the horrible things piled on top of more horrible things and on and on and on what he's going to do in the abomination and turning Jerusalem into Sodom and trampling on it for three and a half years. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, why don't I just switch to me? Okay, um, am I hopefully I'm unmuted, but okay. Next up, we're going to go into Daniel 9, and uh, we'll start out with you, Derek, if you want to unmute. Okay. There we go. I don't know. All right. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is one of the most discussed, debated sections of the book of Daniel. Uh, I'm just going to skip right down to verse 24 in the we 70 go. weeks, because uh, the 70 weeks prophecy is, um, in in my view, this is the timeline of uh, prophecy. Uh, the 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit and to anoint a most holy place. Uh, by, by the way, this is why uh, I lean toward the pre-tribulation view. 70 weeks are decreed about your people. Presumably, Gabriel was referring to the Jews. And since we're looking at this as 70 prophetic weeks, 70 blocks of seven years each, um, with 69 weeks having been completed, we're waiting for the 70th week, that final seven-year period that uh, usually is referred to as the Great Tribulation. Um, since these are referring to the Jews, presumably when that 70th week comes about, the church is not here. Now, again, that's kind of speculative, but that is one of the things that kind of le that pushed me into the camp of the pre-tribulationists. Um, this is really interesting because there's um, 
a book that was written about 100 years ago by a gentleman named Sir Robert Anderson called The Coming Prince. Anderson was a brilliant man. He was actually one of the investigators in the Jack the Ripper murders, which bizarrely was headed up by the superintendent of Metropolitan Police, Sir Charles Warren, who found Warren's shaft to get up into Jerusalem. Um, he also found the Moabite stone, the Amisha stela, and uh, he found the uh, stela in the temple on the summit of Mount Hermon that makes reference to the Watchers. So um, Warren is the connection between the Watchers and Mount Hermon and Jack the Ripper, which is bizarre. Sharon discovered this while researching her, her fiction series. Anyway, um, Anderson, one of his investigators, wrote this book, and he applied the same skills he used as an investigator to interpreting his prophecy. And he was uh, intelligent enough to realize that when you're dealing with the biblical period of history, um, you had to deal with the lunar calendar. In other words, a 360-day year, 12, 30-day months, rather than a 365-day solar calendar. So he goes through in this book and lays out point by point how he calculated the prophecy of Daniel and how it pinpointed to the day the arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem. I won't go through that here for the sake of time, but you can find the coming prince available online. It's in the public domain. So, um, I mean, he went to the Royal Astronomer at Greenwich so he could find when exactly the first of Nisan began in the year 442 BC or whenever it was when Artaxerxes made his decree to Nehemiah to rebuild the walls. And from there, calculated the number of days 360 times 69 times seven. And that exactly coincides with um, the Friday before Passover in the year 32 AD. So again, the precision of prophecy in the book of Daniel is absolutely astonishing. The question is, what does it mean from verse 26 onward? After 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing, presumably, that means um, when you get that plus the initial, uh, the initial um, seven weeks, after 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's usually interpreted as a prophecy, and I agree, of the, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus and the destruction of Rome. But the people of the prince who is to come, who is the prince who is to come? Is that a reference to the Antichrist? And if so, does this mean the Romans, who destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. This is often interpreted as the Antichrist making a covenant with Israel or with the Jews for seven years. But it doesn't actually say that here. You really have to read that into and interpret. That is one interpretation, but who are the many? We don't know that for a fact that it, this refers to Israel. Um, and for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. Now, as Gary pointed out, this probably refers to the Antichrist putting an end to the sacrifices in the, uh, in the temple. But again, it's so nonspecific that there are other interpretations that have been floated here. Um, presumably, the one who has got the power to make this covenant with the many, whoever the many are, is a global ruler at this point. The final sentence here, and on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. This is so vague, I honestly don't have a solid opinion as to what the heck that means. Uh, there are some who suggest that the wing of abominations may refer to one section of the temple where unacceptable sacrifices have been resumed or are being performed. But honestly, I don't know. All I can say for sure is that the 62 weeks or the, the 69 weeks leading up to the arrival of uh, Messiah in Jerusalem um, nailed Jesus' arrival to the day, um, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We're still waiting for that final seven-week period. And I, I would just say this, as we get distressed at trying to figure out what end times prophecy means. The apostles, the uh, disciples of Jesus who learned directly from him for three and a half years, didn't understand the prophecies of his first coming, even in Acts chapter one, when they were still asking him, are you gonna restore the kingdom to Israel now? 
So we're not likely to understand the prophecies of his second coming any better than they did until it's after the fact. And we can look back and say, oh, yeah, should have should have got that one. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I, I like the I like the yeah. quip, Derek, where, uh, you know, obviously it's tongue in cheek, but the 30 minutes of silence in heaven, you know, and. And I've heard it said that the reason why there's 30 minutes of silence that falls, everything is God's given us time to all correct our theology. Because mm -hmm. we're all wrong, you know, yeah. the bottom line will be that we're, we're all wrong. We're all right, but we're all wrong at the exact same time. So yeah, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in agreement. There's, there, there's just certain things where we have to say, I don't know, he's the Lord and I'm not, you know, and I, I always say, I want to err on the side of not being Job's friends who darken <laughs> his counsel with words without wisdom and be like, who am I? Who am I, who am I to say, Hey, I think I really got this figured out. It's like, for all, for all I know, we're going to be so wrong. It's not even funny, but the Lord's graciousness and his loving kindness and even his doting delight over us never changes, even in our, uh, even in our attempts to try to understand the most high, you know? So I'm in for total sure. agreement. For sure. Uh, Gary, next up. <clears throat> yeah, good stuff on uh, Derek's part. And one thing I do uh, tend to agree with and what I try and recommend to people is that do not confuse church prophecy with prophecy for Judah or for Israel. Um, there's distinct set of prophecies. And in this case, the church isn't mentioned. So we want to be careful to over speculate on how what that means for the church whichever way your biases may want to go, you want to be careful with that. But what we do get is, as, as Derek was talking about, seven years set aside for the completion of everything that will set up for, for, for the millennium. And it's not, doesn't say for part of a week, as a lot of people would like you to, to to understand it says for a whole week there's seven years that are set aside seven days which is the allegory and and also derek's 100 right we have to understand prophetic years as in 30 day months and 360 day years if we want to understand that and all the numbers in daniel and revelation uh that were provided they revolve around that in that seven sort of years and in daniel 9 26 um we have this word, the end, used twice, and that's the Hebrew word ketz, Q-E-T-S, -E as it's transliterated into English, 77093, and it means the end of time, the latter days. So this is reserved for a specific period that will flow together, just as you get a middle of that seven years when the sacrifice will be stopped. And Derek is absolutely 100% accurate that it doesn't say Antichrist, but it follows Daniel 7, 8, and 9, and it seems to be, but, you know, to be for the people who disagree with our positions, that's a legitimate argument. We have to recognize it, but it does line everything up like with the timing of Antichrist coming to power at the in Revelation 13 for three and a half years, Second Thessalonians 2, 4, where he sets him up as, as God in the temple. And with Jesus setting up at the midpoint of the last seven years in his chronology, the abomination and a reference back to Daniel that matches up sort of perfectly that he's splitting it into those two, three and a half years and what you get in, in into the book of, of Revelation. So, I look at this uh, last seven years as a very important piece for the world to understand and that uh, whether or not we're here or we're not here, we still need to understand that because as Derek said, we may not have all the information. It, prophecy unfolds in ways that people don't expect it. And, uh, and as he mentioned, you know, missing the Messiah how you have all the prophecies, how could you miss it? They're the most educated people in terms of the Old Testament prophecy that ever was, and they still got it wrong because they left their own agendas, preconceived conclusions, and biases overshadow and did not listen to other possibilities and how those scriptures were being fulfilled right before right before their eyes. Some obviously got the message. So we want to be careful of that. And that this sacrifice that is being stopped on a wing of the temple, as some English translations would say, an overspreading or an extremity, seems to be an 
extension somehow, some way onto the existing El Mosca temple that's there and some sort of accommodation into this universal religion that would be the only thing that could have the ability to permit those sacrifices to happen. And this would be a worldwide polytheist beast one, not an Islamic one, because an Islamic, in my opinion, an, an Islamic, as we understand it today, world religion would never permit the Jewish people to do that. So this has to be something that is religiously unifying that is going on at the same time, which is why we need to look at the rising of the last seven years as to the events before with the universal religion that's rising before the start of the last seven years and this t world government coming together at that same time, but subservient to uh, the world religion who um, they are going to hand their power over to Antichrist to destroy Babylon as it's described in Revelation 17 and right after the midpoint of the last seven years obviously for when he sets up Antichrist sets up his religion at the time of that abomination so and for the people who think that um, those first three and a half years that have come along I think in Daniel 11 from about verse 21 to about 29 describes the events that's going on in these first three and a half years on his rise to power. Okay, perfect. No problem. That was awesome. I love that. And uh, Jamie, if you want to, uh, if you want to just jump on it and then uh, if I know you need to lead the church tomorrow, I know you, you're going to be busy. You, you can, you know, you can, you can end it if you like, I think you're muted right now, but go ahead. Yeah, it's hard. We're just starting to get into some good stuff, man. But yeah, it's it is it's one of those things where it is important to make the distinctions between the eschatology that's relevant to the Jewish people, that the people of a covenant, and um, to the church. And there are hardcore distinctions. I know there's there's been a lot with all this replacement theology stuff that's been going on for the last 60, 80 years. And it just convolutes and, and disrupts and corrupts everything. And it is important to look at, at it through the proper context of just the plain scriptures as God laid out. You know, when he's dealing with his people versus when he's dealing with his church, when he's dealing with the bride versus when he's dealing with the body, right? He's constantly making these distinctions. So, you know, it's 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 interesting that it talks about the fact that war will continue into the end. I don't know why I key in on that. I'm like, that's very particular language that and war will continue into the end, right? And then we he leads right into this confirmation of the covenant of the many. And when you think about the historicity of of the nation of Israel, of the the geostrategic territory of Israel, of the spirit of Israel, of the scattering of Israel, of the regathering of Israel, of the Balfour Declaration, of the White Papers, of the, you know, at, at all, you name it, 1967, 1948, 1947, it goes on and on and on. There really has been war continuing for Israel all the way into the end. There has never been a time where there has been un, uh, unmolested peace on, on that geostrategic piece of land and God's people. Even when they're scattered around the world, the enemy has still sought to pursue them and run them down, uh, the Jewish people. So anyways, it, it's just interesting language to me, but I'm in agreement with what both Gary has said and, and Derek as well. And I I know um, Scott will, will have some cool things to say as well too, but yeah, I'm in total agreement. There's not too much you can add to that, that laying out of the weeks. And like Derek said, it's probably one of the most ad nauseum sections of scripture that has been studied very particular scriptures that have been studied because you know although there are enigmatic things about scriptures you know including rapture doctrines one of them it's like if they would have known they would have never crucified christ right it's like there are particular things that are strategically tactically as i would do as a tacticianer you know coming from the marine corps infantry there there's particular things that i would do to make sure that the enemy doesn't know and understand the next maneuvers that i need to do so they can't uh, do in runs around it and make faint maneuvers it's even the same thing with the 70 weeks of daniel or rapture or you know a couple other different uh doctrinal things where it's like we 
kind of know, but not for certain. And that's actually a good thing. If we don't know for certain, then that means those guys don't know for certain either. And the Lord's wise in uh, in, uh, keeping some things a little bit enigmatic till they're actually revealed in real time, you know? And it's interesting what Gary said. I, I think it's it's mind boggling to me, but it's human nature. I get it right. In in our fallen state that, that they missed Christ's first coming. They, they studied it and studied it and studied it like we're all doing currently looking for Christ's second coming. They, they knew it in and out all the scriptures and mo- memorize it. And they still missed it. And I go, how much more so at the second coming of Christ when it speaks to it being a time the likes of which never has been, ne- never will be again. When I return, will I even find faith in the land? You know, if I didn't shorten those days, there'd be no flesh left alive, all kinds of layers of interpretation there. And it's like, we will miss it then as well, too, if we're not rooted in the simplicity of an identity in Christ alone, the hope of glory, the hope of the resurrection, the completed work of Christ Jesus. If we get this cloud and privilege strategy you know, pulling our mind in these 10,000 different directions, we're going to miss the second coming just as easily as the great scholars and academics in the first century missed his first coming. So, you know, I always say, well, major in the majors and minor in the minors, you know, for lack of a better word. But yeah, I mean, I appreciate you having me on. I wish I could stay through to the end, but I got to get up and uh, preach first thing in the morning. So (laughs) it's getting late on my end. God bless you. I really hey. appreciate you, Jamie. Thank you. Yeah, Jamie. Nice meeting you, man. You're, I like the way you uh, you do your business, man. Good job. Yeah, yeah thank you, thanks, guys. I appreciate God bless it. You, man. I'll, I'll see you gentlemen later. Thank you. Nice God to meet you. Good night, Jamie. All right. Next up, uh, Scott Mitchell. Go ahead. Well, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed what Jamie just shared, and and all all, all of us uh, have been just amazing. I, I don't know that I can add much to anything but I, I do agree with uh, all of these brothers that um, the the seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. This is a prophecy, letting Israel know. And I do believe that Daniel seventy weeks are the pivotal timetable that we we may or may not be able to figure out. Uh, Paul said he, we were to be stewards of the mysteries of God. He didn't say we were to be the revealers. <laughs> we don't necessarily have all the answers, uh, but we're to proclaim them as the Word of God states it. Um, I'll, I'll focus on this, my two cents worth about it. And that is that, um, I do think personally, the abomination of desolation is, ha- is going to have something to do with that image that's set up. Uh, when Christ said in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel stand in the holy place. And when we read in revelation 13, that the false prophet is going to make an image of the beast, there could be a connection there. Uh, and I may be wrong about that, but it seems to me it would make sense that uh, if he set up his own image and that could be related to AI or I don't know what, but it, it could be that that's a, that's the sign for the Judeans to flee uh, into the wilderness. But I the, the last thought I wanted to give on this so we don't beat it to death is that um, I'm interested in the in the timing of the gap. So you've got 69 weeks fulfilled. I totally agree with Derek on that at Christ and his crucifixion and the seven weeks are yet to uh, be fulfilled. And we, I think we're in agreement. That's the time of tribulation. And one reason I might lean to a pre-tribulation rapture too, is because Jeremiah calls this the time of Jacob's trouble. The seven years of tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not the time of the church's trouble. Um, If the rapture is going to happen because we for 2000 years almost have been uh, preaching the grace of God, and what some would call the dispensation of grace. That message is not the message of the seven years of tribulation. They're preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand again. Uh, God's got 144,000 sealed Jewish males set aside to preach that message. Uh, Two witnesses that I believe are probably Moses and Elijah are going to reappear doing the signs and wonders, and the Jew requires a sign. So everything is pointing to Israel in this time, not that the world's not going through the wrath of God being poured out on it, but that God is refining them, uh, and one third is going to come through the fire. So I see the uniqueness of that. And then I I play with this. This is pure speculation. So this is just me goofing around. And and it's so late, I'm going to have to go after this. Because uh, again, for me, it's almost uh, one o'clock in the morning. But um, I think about the fact that, you know, we use passages like Ecclesiastes 1, and that which has been is that which shall be. And and we use that uh, to understand uh, the Nephilim's influence in the future. 
uh, we use Second Peter chapter three, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And I, I do believe that's a, a key to understanding prophecy too. So if I apply that thought, I, I like to play with this. In Hosea chapter five, verse 15, when God says, I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and in, in, my, in their affliction, they will seek me early. I believe that's the Lord returning back and ascending to the throne of God, the father, Jesus Christ. He's waiting for Israel, the nation, to make their confession. I believe Jesus Christ had a national ministry to Israel when he first came. It was a secret that he would die for the sins of mankind. None of the princes of this world could know it, just like uh, uh, Gary was talking about earlier. Um, but um, after he ascended up, he's waiting. Uh, they're going to abide many days without a king, without a prince. And I think that's this time period. Uh, the prince might be Michael, the archangel. He's the prince of Israel. Uh, but in Hosea 6, it's almost like it's Israel's response. And they say, come, let us return to the Lord. He has stricken us and he will heal us. He has smitten, he will bind us up. After two days, we shall live in his sight. And, uh, or I'm misquoting it, but what if the two days was the 2000 years that Peter spoke of? It's just fun to think about. I have no idea when the Lord's going to return, but I sure hope it's soon because <laughs> I am so ready for it. And that's that's where my where I leave it at that. You know, Daniel to me, Daniel 9 is the pivotal passage to help us understand the fulfillment of prophecy. Awesome. Amen. Amen. I don't know why I keep pinning myself. Uh awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. That was amazing. And uh We'll go into 10, 11, and 12, you know, and just we'll try to do it quick. Uh, I know you guys all have to go to sleep. And Derek, I think you're like, uh, you're also almost hitting one o'clock in the morning. Next time well, we do these roundtables, I'm going to start it at eight, maybe a little bit earlier. Well, you could do you could do another show for 10, 11, and 12 if you wanted um, when you've got the rest of more idea. of the panel. Because okay. it, it, there's a lot lot in there as well. I'm just saying it's your, yeah. but. Uh, Nothing yeah. wrong with the part two, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So it's, all right, if, one, if everybody's the, good, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Things that I was just thinking about though on on uh, Daniel nine is is that it doesn't use the word tribulation or trouble in those passages at all. Uh, there is, uh, as in Jeremiah thirty seven, the time of Jacob's trouble, Hebrew sarah t s a r a h. Same word that's used in Daniel. Uh, 12 for the last three and a half years when the Michael rises uh, time of trouble. That's the cognate word for philipses for trouble, affliction, uh, oppression that's used in the, in the, in the new Testament. And it means exactly the same thing. Uh, so if you look at the tribulations that are used in the new Testament, you have tribulations that all Christians go through. Um, you have, Affliction in Matthew 24, 8, and that's the word thalipsis, and it's the same word for the great tribulation that's used in Matthew 24, 21. And then in Mark's version in, Matthew, in Mark 13, 19, it says affliction for Matthew uses tribulation, and that's the tribulation after the abomination, and then you have that affliction thalipsis before the tribulation and then in revelation 2 10 you also have tribulation that's used seems to be in a prophetic sort of nature in uh, revelation 2 10 for 10 days of tribulation which if you match that up with revelation or with daniel that means like there's probably three more years of heavy tribulation even before the last seven years if you add that on to the first three and a half years and then the second three and a half years so I always sort of have try and get people to tread on that carefully so that uh, it doesn't lead you into areas where you might start to be conflating tribulations because you have a tribulation that's not been seen since the end of the world. And we know Israel's going to go through that and Judah's going to go through that. Christians won't go through that. I think that's pretty much unless you get into some later rapture sort of timing on it but you also have these tribulations of the saints that are also used in revelation 7 which the ones that are shown in revelation 6 are told to wait for to be martyred like they are and that's the same word ellipses and so 
there is going to be tribulation. It's just a matter of when it stops for Christians and it turns into that great tribulation. And so I just like, you know, to throw things out there like that, that we want to separate prophecies for Israel and not confuse them with prophecies for the church. But we also need to understand the cognate words for that Mark chronology, that mesh between the Old and the New Testament. And so where we get that meshing is the last three and a half years for trouble in the Old Testament and tribulation in the New Testament for the Great Tribulation. But that doesn't necessarily dismiss other tribulation that the New Testament says that we're going to be going through. And that the elect is are the people who go through this type of tribulation. So we want to be careful of that. That's just one of the things that I would leave people with is that, again, we don't know how prophecy is going to unfold and we're all directionally trying to, trying to figure it out, but we want to make sure, well, we should, I think we ought to try and not to, um, I guess, conflate terms and things when they're specifically assigned to different peoples or different time frames in prophetic chronology. Awesome. It, I, I want to respond to that because I totally agree with Gary. In, in no way would I, would I say anything he said is, is incorrect. It's absolutely true. And, and to add to that, I would say that Paul also wrote, we must do great, much tribulation and enter into the kingdom of God. I believe the church has been in tribulation from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, affliction, persecution. It's, it's never stopped. I, I trust, I, I think it's the beginning of sorrow started the moment crisis ended up and yeah. we've been in that time. So I, I agree with you. We do. And it probably increases in the fig tree generation, like the sorrows do. Yeah. I, I would agree with that too. And I do think we're in the fig tree generation. So I think we're in alignment on that and being cautious is a good thing. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, guys, I think what we'll do is we'll end it here. Uh, we'll have a 10, 11 and 12. Uh, maybe we can cover a little bit of, uh, you know, earlier of, of the other ones we didn't cover too on the next one, but, uh, any last words, uh, Derek for the audience? No, just, uh, the book of Daniel is one of those that is, uh, really difficult to understand, which is why the only parts we ever hear in church are, uh, you know, Daniel and the lion's den and, uh, you know, this, <laughs> the Daniel in the fiery furnace, um, which, uh, this year, believe it or not, I made it to the age of 61 before hearing the joke about may the fourth be with you, <laughs> but not referring to, uh, not referring to star Wars day, but may the fourth as in the fourth man in the fire be yeah. with you. So uh, keep oh, that in mind like for that. next, next May. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> let's go. All right. Thank you so much. And, uh, any last words, uh, Gary for the, for the audience. No, just a, an, an astounding um, discussion on viewpoints and adding, I think, some flesh to uh, Daniel and how important it is. I just, I just, I just love these sort of discussions, and I don't mm -hmm. think anybody, whether or not it's in the audience or on the panel, won't have picked up something that they hadn't considered, or maybe they want to look into deeper, just based on the talent and the research that was presented tonight. Just an awesome, awesome job. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I, you. I I totally agree with that. And then Scott, go ahead, brother. Any last words? I just want to echo what Gary said. Absolutely. And and the fact that um, I appreciate you guys having us on because to, to be able to have this collection of minds to discuss the word of God is a true blessing for me to hear everything you, you brothers have said tonight. I, 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 agree. I couldn't agree more. And uh, Jason, any last words, brother? The last words I want to say is uh, for our listeners that not only is the book of Daniel and Daniel uh, about prophecy, but I, I like to point on that. It's also important that he was a, a prayer. He prayed in every situation when, when he, everything he did, he prayed, he gave, he gave homage. He gave, you know, he gave props to, to, to the most high every time, but he prayed for everything, everything he was doing. That's, I feel like that's important to touch on for our listeners too. any situation before you even get into it, pray, you know, mm -hmm. Whatever it is, have God Amen. with you every day. If you're going to go buy a car, if you're going to go to lunch, if you're going to go driving by yourself, God has to be with you and he has to be with you and, and you have to keep that relationship open all the time. But that, I feel like Daniel is his strongest attribute was just prayer, man. He, 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 he knew how to pray and uh, our listeners should uh, know that too. So if you guys are listening and especially, and I also want to also thank all these guys here too, you know, this stuff is, is very important. So Kick it into yes. high gear, guys. You know, and God bless everybody here, man. Thank you for coming on. 
Yeah, and I think Daniel, honestly, like I was saying earlier, it's like it, it teaches us a way to navigate through the pagan society that we are in. And, uh, you know, like just like uh, Derek was talking about, you know, we got the Washington Monument, you know, 6,666 inches tall, 66.6 inches wide, you know, and just all this 666 there. We have the obelisk, you know, we have all these different things we're going through. The Capitol building, we got George Washington on the top ascending to godhood. We got all these Freemasons, uh, Black nobility, secret societies, Jesuits, uh, all these different things we're going through as Christians that are that are behind the scenes that a lot of normal Christians don't get exposed to. So that's what I, I would like to say to my audience to make sure you study stuff like, you know, look look into the uh, Bible mysteries that Scott has, look into the to the books that, you know, Derek Gilbert has and that, that Gary Wayne has, because you're going to find out the mysteries that we need to know because we want to know, uh, you know, if, a, if someone's going to break into our house, a thief, we need to know what they're equipped with. So when you start reading books like this, besides the Bible, it'll also kind of connect what we're going through as Christians and in society, we need to know how to navigate. And Jason talks about it. That was perfect, bro. Prayer. Imagine if Daniel, when his 20, 21 days of fasting, imagine if he only fasted for 19 or 18, maybe that maybe Gabriel wouldn't have showed up and talked to him or, or that angel wouldn't have came and talked to him because he fasted for 21 days, you know? And, um, I just think it's a beautiful book. And for me, this, this extensive study that I got, uh, from you gentlemen, and also from me doing this show, it's it's amazing. I, I I never noticed certain things that I did pick up as I was reading, and and I and I appreciate you gentlemen dearly. And Ali, uh, Jamie, I know you guys are not here with us, but you are here with us in spirit. But we appreciate you guys, and you guys, thank you. We'll have another uh, roundtable definitely again, and I appreciate everything you guys do for us. You know, thanks for you guys' books that you guys produce, and you know, uh, you know all the documentaries and everything you guys are a part of. It really wakes up uh, our, our Christians that we need this. So uh, like we always do, we're going to end it in prayer. So Father God, in the name of Jesus, we appreciate you putting these gentlemen uh, on this panel to go over the book of Daniel. And, and Lord, thank you so much for being so precise. Uh, thank you for, for I, I even thank the, the scholars that do have this doubt. They doubt because you were so precise and you were so amazing with your prophecies and, and Daniel. And thank you for giving us... Um, a guide on how to be, you know, with Jesus and also how to be like, like Daniel, you know, you, he, he was definitely uh, going through persecution. He was with, with uh, all these pagans, uh, even his uh, companions, they were all told to, to bow down and they didn't bow. And, you know, there's just so much stuff in here that, that we can unpack that we appreciate you even giving us the time. Like I always say, thank you for the air we breathe. Thank you for the water we drink, Lord. And thank you so much for the food that we get to eat. And thank you for blessing us with the Bible. Thank you for keeping the Bible legal for us to be able to have access to. I know there's certain countries out there that came and read the Bible. They, they get they get killed or their head cut off for it so thank you for providing this for us and providing us this platform and giving us a clear connection lord and and we appreciate everything you do lord thank you in jesus name amen amen amen, amen. wow everybody thank you so much and everybody that's listening please subscribe to our youtube uh subscribe to Derek's, uh scott's gary's and ali's and jamie's and everything and please guys um you know purchase their books uh, and, and support them. They came in here for free. They're giving us their time. It's almost one in the morning for these gentlemen. So thank you guys so much. Uh, if you could, like I said, subscribe and share this podcast so people could see God bless you.